Welcome to The Savage Truth. I am your host, Cicely Davis. Today on The Savage Truth, the talentless, shallow, clout-seeking, selfie-taking man of the year, Kim Kardashian, is featured on the cover of the Woke GQ magazine. Apparently, according to GQ, there weren't any accomplished actual men who measured up to her or him in the year of 2023. We need to talk about the obvious absurdity of this issue as due November 28th, but dive deeper into the importance and the tragedy of the invasion of male spaces. Well, I'm a woman and I say, let's give men their spaces back and let's do it now on The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis. Welcome back to another episode of The Savage Truth. I am your host, Cicely Davis. Hope your Thanksgiving was enjoyable. If you're new to the podcast, as the listenership continues to grow, welcome. Thank you to all of you who have continued to tune in and for telling others to do so as well. Please like, share, subscribe, and leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Truly, folks, I really, really ask that you please take the time to leave that five-star rating. Leave that five-star rating. I am honored to share my take on today's culture here in the great U.S. of A. And though I believe it is in serious decline, I also believe that the true majority of Americans wish for American traditions to return. And those we haven't lost, we wish for those to be preserved. Well, you probably say, Cicely, what traditions? What traditions do you speak of? What has been lost or what specifically are those traditions that are in decline? And I thank you so much for asking. Well, how about naming a man for a man of the year? That's one I can mention right off the top of my head. So the talentless Kim Kardashian is on the cover of GQ magazine as due to drop on November 28th. Now, she happens to be the stepdaughter of the previous Bruce Jenner, a.k.a. Caitlyn Jenner, who won Woman of the Year in 2015. Now, on the cover, she wears a masculine suit, holding a bag of Cheetos and sucking her finger. You know, like a man, a manly man would do. Can't you just picture George Washington, John Adams, Frederick Douglass, Roosevelt, Grant, John Wayne, holding a bag of whatever popular snack of the time, sucking their finger as they grace the cover of a magazine, beholding the glory, strength, and image of manhood. Now, apparently the article inside, for those who will actually buy and read this article or the magazine itself, praises the professional selfie-taking Hollywood pass around for her business sense and accomplishments. Having just expanded her Spanx like line called skims to menswear quoting I just wanted men to know what all the hype was all about now no one listening to the savage truth is without intellect I'm sure I think we can all figure out this stunt isn't just about wokeness but about the Benjamins as well I think everyone and their dog knows that print magazines are on the serious decline And GQ is amongst the latest pop culture brands to mock and emasculate men everywhere. Following in her stepfather, Caitlin's high-heeled footsteps, she glorifies in an obvious, useless titled award. These are just made-up honors meant to generate clicks and headlines. This is not unlike naming a celebrity or influencer for an honor or an award with the expectation that they will bring with them more members, more viewership, and or sponsorships. Either way, masculinity in America takes yet another hit in this continued societal decline through this deliberate attack and insult to men. So when I speak of decline of our society and its traditions, I include and I refer to male and female roles. Now, I did some digging on this subject and decided instead of giving you statistical data or a throwback to the good old days kind of answer, I Googled this to see what others, to see what other Americans have to say on the subject. And be honest with you, I got some really great answers. Here are a few. And I took the 10, top 10. 
the decline in communal activities, for example, bowling leagues, to signify the issue of isolation. Number two, kids to go outside and play. People actually miss kids just going outside to play. You know, climbing trees, being creative with just a good old stick, hide and go seek, etc. Three, knowing and interacting with your immediate neighbors. People can't tell you the names of their neighbors any longer, thereby losing that desire to build community. From here is where we shovel each other's driveways or look out for intruders, etc. People miss fraternal societies. We're actually going to talk about this a little later. Masons, Knights of Columbus, Order of the Moose, Shriners, etc. Have you ever met any member of these clubs that are under the age of 50? People miss single income families where the man is just the breadwinner. They miss no respect for authority. Enough said there, right? People miss malls being a place to hang out. Trick-or-treating and Easter egg hunts. Number nine, family meals at the dinner table. This is a big one. This is a big one for me. And I, as much as possible, did this with our kids. And last, number 10, having the general or the neighborhood store. People miss having the general store or the neighborhood store that was owned by that certain family or that owner. And they were familiar with the owners and spent time there. They miss that. So this GQ stunt made me think about the invasion of male spaces as I watched the football games last week with the female refs, the female staffers on the sidelines. i be honest with you, it bothered me. This actually bothered me. Football, as you all know, I'm a huge fan of football. And from a previous episode I recorded, football is a man's game. Now, the audience is inclusive, but players, coaches, staff, owners, and even the mascot is male. And just as I mentioned in last episode, it's lucrative to parade women around in pageants and runways. We duly enjoy watching men duke it out in arenas, being at boxing matches or wrestling or MMA or sports in general. It's in our nature, just how we're built. Allow me to mention a few spaces in which men have been squeezed out of their rightful places and spaces. See if you can recognize or reminisce or agree. And let me start out by saying this. Once upon a time, the world belonged to men. Literally. Because men had exclusive power in both private and public life, they controlled their surrounding environment and the way in which space was designed and decorated. Consequently, the world was once a very masculine place. Thankfully, we've made progress in the arena of gender equality, and women have brought their influence to bear in both the home and in the workplace. However, as with many other areas of modern life, the pendulum has swung from one extreme to the other. Instead of creating a world that's friendly to both male and female space, we've created one that benefits female space at the expense of male space. I think we can all recognize that there has been a true decline of male space in the public sphere. For most of humanity, the public sphere was solely a man's domain. Up until as far as the 19th century, it wasn't even appropriate for women to visit outside the home without a man accompanying her. However, in the last hundred years, areas designated as male space have shrunk because of changes in attitudes towards gender and anti-discrimination laws. Now, I know you probably say, okay, Cicely, now you said this is, you said something different in the last episode that female spaces are being invaded. Absolutely. But the patriarchy has been attacked for quite longer. Women have invaded male spaces for a much longer period and has continued. There are five public spaces that were once exclusive, once exclusively for men. The workplace, the bar, the barbershop, the gym, and the fraternal lodge or social club. Let's talk about the workplace. Perhaps the largest male space in public life was the workplace. For many families in the West, the Industrial Revolution created a strict division of labor where men worked in a factory or office and women stayed home to take care of the children. If women did work, they largely did so in female industries like textile factories. As a result, the workplace was a predominantly male space 
with rules and a culture that favored male sensibilities. When the first women started to enter the workforce in greater numbers during the 50s and 60s, Many men saw it as an encroachment into their space and resorted to crude sexual harassment as a way to keep women in their place. Thanks to laws during the civil rights era and increased sensitivity and desire by business to create non-hostile workplaces, such harassment is seen for what it is and shunned by most males today. The Bar For centuries, a man could visit a bar and be in the exclusive presence of other men. Because drinking was seen as a corrupting influence on the purity and innocence of women, bars were completely off limits to ladies. Exceptions were made for prostitutes, of course. Out of the presence of women and children, men could open up more and and revel in their masculinity over a mug of cold ale. However, the bar as a men's only hangout would quickly see its demise during the dry years of prohibition. By banning alcohol, prohibition forced drinking underground. Speakeasy owners, desperate to make a buck, accepted all drinkers into their establishment, regardless of gender. The economic and political empowerment women experienced during the 20s and 30s made drinking by women more acceptable. By the time prohibition was repealed, the female presence at the local watering hole had become a common appearance. Today, there aren't many bars around that cater only to men, gay bars being an obvious exception. Instead, bars have become a place where the sexes come together to mingle and look for a special someone, even if it's just for the night. Barber shops. Back in the 19th and early 20th century, barbershops were bastions for manliness, and one could be found on every corner. At the barbershop, a man could get a sharp haircut, enjoy a relaxing shave, and take part in some manly banter with his barber and the other customers. Unfortunately, several factors led to the decline of barbershops. Perhaps the biggest factor was the rise of the unisex salon. Places like Supercuts, which were neither beauty salons nor barbershops, catered to both men and women. Many states' licensing boards accelerated their trend by ceasing to issue barber licenses altogether in favor of offering a unisex cosmetologist license to all those seeking to enter their hair cutting profession. Unlike the bar or the workplace, the barbershop hasn't been infiltrated by women. Most ladies prefer the salon and wouldn't dream of having old George take the clippers to their head. Rather, barbershops have simply become harder to find. Even if you do find one, don't be surprised if old George has been replaced with Georgia. Let's talk about the boxing clubs and gyms. Like bars, boxing clubs and gyms were once exclusively male only. In the time of women-free gyms, men could focus solely on building their bodies and not worry about impressing the ladies. They were dark, dingy places. They smelled of sweat and exhaustion. They were free from the sound of Lady Gaga blasting over the speakers. The only noise was of grunts and the clanging of weights. However, in response to the women's movement, many states and cities passed ordinances prohibiting male-only businesses and clubs. As a result, women advanced on gyms along with step classes and leotards. Despite these anti-discrimination ordinances, many states have overlooked the proliferation of female-only gyms like curves that have opened up across the country. Even when men bring lawsuits challenging these all-women establishments, they're often dismissed. This unfortunate double standard has only aided in the decline of male space and the rise of female space. Fraternal lodges and social clubs. Fraternal lodges and all male clubs and restaurants have a long and storied history in the United States and in other countries in the West. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, men flocked to fraternal lodges like the Freemasons and the Odd Fellows in order to take part in male fellowshipping. At one time in American history, one in four men belonged to a fraternal lodge of some sort. However, by 1950, 
membership began to decline as the demands of family life and work increased, leaving men little time for lodge life. Under pressure from women's rights groups, some lodges allowed women to join their ranks, but for the most part, fraternal lodges remain all male. Their biggest problem is just recruiting new and younger members. And let's talk about finally the decline of male living space in the home. Paralleling the decline in male space in public was the decline of male space in the domestic sphere. This perhaps was even more dramatic for men because, well, it hit so close to home. A man was once king of the castle, but in a blink of an eye, he was dethroned. Here's a brief primer on how it all went down. The Industrial Revolution bringing an end to the male space. Before the Industrial Revolution, you could find most men working in or around the home. This was a time of self-sufficient small farmers and noble artisans. The man used his home as his place of business, and consequently homes were designed to accommodate the needs of the dirty work of farming, blacksmithing, and leatherworking. When you work every day in dirt and grime, you can't worry about taking off your boots so you don't soil the rug. This just slows down the work. Additionally, the home design luxuries we take for granted today just weren't available to people in the society at that time. Carpeting, wallpaper, drapes, and even glass windows were items reserved for the very wealthy. Consequently, the home had a predominantly masculine vibe. Exposed beams, dirt floors, and earthen fireplaces were the norm. Tools were left here and there. Guns hung above the fireplaces. The sheepdog came in and out as he pleased, and a man didn't think about wiping his feet before he came inside. He didn't have to worry about a nagging wife getting on him for mucking up the place because the place was already mucked up. But little did men know that the days of a male-centered abode were numbered. By the middle of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Families moved from the country to the city, and men left home to work in the factories. Women, of course, stayed home to run the household. Thus, a strict work-home dichotomy developed, with women giving domain over the latter. The cult of domesticity, popular during this time, encouraged middle- and upper-class women to make the home a haven in the heartless world for their husband and children, a place where a man could relax and feel comforted after a long day of toiling in the trenches. Without an earthen floor and sawdust shavings everywhere, the possibility of keeping things clean and tidy became attainable, and women bought carpets, white drapes, and flower-filled vases in the names of creating a soft oasis for their husbands. But what they really had made was the type of place a woman would feel most comfortable and men fled their doily laden home to spend time at the bars and fraternal lodges with their boys. The home had become a female space. With no room to call their own, men were forced to build their male sanctuaries in the most unattainable or uninhabited, uninhabitable parts of the home. Garages and attics and basements quickly became the designated space for men, while the women and children had free reign over the rest of the house. Men filled these rooms with interior designs and the trappings of manliness, animal heads, discarded furniture, and pictures of sports figures or women would ad adorn the rooms. They would use their man caves as a place to retreat to when the demands of work and family life felt suffocating. Here, they could play cards with their friends or tinker around, working on their car, reading the paper, or doing some woodworking. But even those undesirable areas of the home would be taken away from men. Basements and attics became game or entertainment rooms to be used mainly by the children. And even the least feminine of all places, the garage, would be cleaned up and domesticated. With every room co-opted in the house by women or children and with few bastions of manliness in the public spear left standing to escape to, men were relegated to claiming a solitary chair as their designated male space. Think about Archie Bunker 
or the dad from Frasier. So why is this important? Why is male space important? So you might be thinking, what's the big deal? Isn't it a good thing we've gotten past the archaic gender segregated stuff? Absolutely. Well, more like yes and no. Don't get me wrong. I'm all in favor of the progress we've made. But again, the pendulum has arguably swung too far to the other extreme, leaving men without their own space. And we often underestimate the effects our surroundings have on our psyche. Just as male friends play an important role in giving men satisfaction and in shaping their manliness, so does male living space. It's an important it's very important that men have a place where they can take off their social mask and revel in masculine energy. For many men, the bureaucracy of corporate culture can leave them feeling powerless and emasculated. Having a man cave at home, a place where a man can decorate as they please and do whatever they want, can give them a much needed sense of control, empowerment, and of course, relaxation. And spending time in the company of other men at an all-male hangout can help a man reconnect with his manliness or remain in touch with it altogether. The health of a society depends on the strength and the vitality of its men. Now, it's clear that GQ is desperate. It's equally clear that the controllers of the woke movement are in the final stages of ending American patriarchy. Unfortunately, men surrender more and more ground in the battle of the sexes. We greatly underestimate the will of our opponent, the left. The rejection of societal order and man's responsibility to lead. Pop culture quit making heroes of men 30 years ago. And we watch Hollywood trade in John Wayne and Cliff Hustable for thugs and brutes, thus reflecting men as bad guys, ones who are easy to hate and disregard. The savage truth is women simply cannot be men. The more we try, the unhappier we become. Men are and always will be bigger, stronger, faster, and better capable to lead. It's in their DNA. It's in their design. God, man, woman, child. That is the order of things. When we see that reflected strongly again, that's when we get back to being quintessentially America. Please like, share, subscribe, and leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And remember, folks, be strong, be bold, be faithful, be true. Until next episode, I'm Cicely Davis. The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis is a production of Front Page Magazine and the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.